The Geopolitics and Empire podcast is joined by a man who needs no introduction, G. Edward Griffin, documentary film producer and author of the seminal Creature from Jekyll Island. I've got the copy right here. And as well, you can see in the background, we have a photo of uh, Jekyll Island. His films and books have covered subjects ranging from the UN, Marxist Revolution in America, Noah's Ark, Natural Cancer Cures, and Geoengineering. Some of his many websites and projects are redpilluniversity.org, needtoknow.news, redpillexpo.org, and realityzone.com. We'll be getting his take on the world today. Listeners may not know, but many years ago, I did some volunteer work on the Reality Zone Unfiltered News newsletter, and I had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Griffin. It's been almost a decade since we had lunch out in California. How are you doing, uh, G. Edward? Oh, I'm doing well. I'm glad you refreshed my memory on that. Yeah, that was quite a while ago. Yeah. Well, I'm doing well. I'm glad to see that you are doing well. I understand you've been traveling around the world, and now you're back in Guadalajara. And uh, so you you look like you're doing well, too. Yeah, I've been trying to es escape from COVID, but anywhere you go in the world, um, there's nowhere to hide from it, from, from COVID-1984, uh, as I call it. And yes, it's an idea. It's, it's not a disease. It's an idea. And ideas travel instantly. <laughs> they don't have to be uh, spread. I mean, they can be very contagious, but they, they, they don't even exist except in an abstraction. So, yeah, they move around pretty fast. And there's no place, uh, yeah, no place to hide. <laughs> and you know, so a, f a few of the topics I had on uh, had in mind that I wanted to talk uh, about were uh, was the COVID situation and how it has seemed to strip away strip away sovereignty from nation states and give power to supranational organizations like the UN, uh, the BLM, Antifa, Marxist Revolution in America, and the econ economic collapse. Uh, and if there's anything else you'd like to get across, you can feel free to do so. Uh, and so I wanted to get to the heart of the matter of what's happening today around the world. And so I thought we might start with the UN, because you wrote a book way back in the 1960s called Fearful Master, a second look at the UN. You did a documentary on the UN looking at Congo uh, and Katanga. And I feel we are experiencing the UN takeover that you warned of so long ago and that COVID-19 is just the pretext. And I've been trying to understand the mechanism of how They've managed to take uh, control of every nation on earth, lock us down. And two things came to light f for me. One was the revelation by the president of Belarus, who said that the IMF, World Bank, and WHO were effectively bribing him with loans in exchange for having him lock down his country, which then I assume is the case with virtually every other national government. And uh, Rose acquires revelations on UN Agenda 21 and how the UN is plugged into local municipalities, states, and provinces, which would explain why local mayors and state governors are going along with the program uh, all around the world. So with your years of insight, can you tell us what is happening right now with COVID in your mind uh, and this overt move by the UN, IMF, and World Bank to strip away sovereignty of all the nations of the world? Yeah, well, there were a lot of issues in that question. That's Actually, that's a multifaceted question, but it's the kind of question that needs to be asked because there's a tendency i think too much for people to want short answers the quick answer the sound bite well what do you think about this and the, you, know, you get 30 seconds to cover it and basically you know what's your position on taxes <laughs> well my position on taxes is that i i don't i don't like them <laughs> and they're too high <laughs> so but that's not that's not a very in-depth analysis of the problem with taxes and why they're there and who benefits and who suffers and so forth. So your question, I think, started off correctly uh, at the international, uh, international concept, the picture of the big picture, what's going on in the world. And I think uh, the, anybody, even those who haven't been following these things carefully, can see out of the peripheral vision, the side of their vision, on the side of their eyes, things are going on around us all the time. Everybody is aware that the world is drifting toward a, an internationalization where there is increasingly less and less difference between the governments of one nation and another. The people who are at the apex of power in all of these governmental institutions, all have the same mindset. Now, that doesn't mean the people have the same mindset. The cultures are still, although they're under attack, the cultures are still pretty solid, I think, 
but they're constantly under attack and being weathered. And uh, and the heart of the people, the the um, the goodwill of the people around the world, that hasn't changed. But at the highest levels of power and authority, something else has been going on. And I think it's because of the of the influence that collectivism has had in the universities, because now we've gone through a couple of generations of young people have gone through the universities. Most of them have been interested in geopolitics and they, they go into political science and sociology and psychology and all of these things. And, and they become imbued with this concept of collectivism, that the world needs to be collectivized more than it already has been, that the group is more important than the individual and that the individual has to be sacrificed if necessary for the greater good of the greater number and all of that. They've come out of the university systems, but this is kind of a, a, a creed that they believe in and they feel that, that it's the right thing to do because they've been taught as I was in school. Fortunately, I wasn't a, a great student at that time. I didn't pay much attention to it, but I was taught that you know the United Nations was our last best hope for peace and that we all had to get rid of this terrible thing called nationalism because that was the cause of wars. If you didn't have nations, nations couldn't fight against each other, could they? And that kind of thing. It all kind of made sense if, if you were interested in those things, which I was not at those at that time. So, But the, the point I'm leading up to here is that all of the leaders in these positions of government authority and education and the media have been through the educational system, and they've come out with this uh, programming. And they're true believers, most of them, that what they're doing is for the betterment of mankind. But um, if you believe in, in if you believe in collectivism, you really believe that the group is more important than the individual, and that means that the individual must be sacrificed if necessary for the greater good of the greater number. And once you have that mentality, then you can you can do anything you want to. You, you can you can perform what would normally be considered the greatest atrocity of all history, like a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. And you could know about, let's say, if you were in Washington, D.C., like FDR and, and the whole government and, and the United States government at the time knew the Japanese were going to attack. They were trying to egg them on to attacking. And um, they actually went out of their way to prevent the military leaders on um, Pearl Harbor from knowing about it. So they would be sitting ducks. They wanted Americans to be killed. They wanted battleships to be sunk to create the psychological impact on the American public to say, oh, look what they did to us. And it was a you know, typical classical false flag attack. And then let's get into the war. Well, that's what they wanted to do anyway. And, and years later, when these people wrote about it and we read their diaries and everything, which are now published, they said, well, yeah, it was a it was a it seemed like a terrible thing to do to allow a uh, a national force to kill our own soldiers and sailors and pretend like we didn't know about it so we could get into the war. But then they said, that, well, yeah, but it was a small price to pay. It was for the greater good of the greater number, because otherwise the world would have been more dangerous than it was. We would have been attacked perhaps here instead of attacking Pearl Harbor, which we wanted them to do. They might have attacked San Francisco, you know, things like that. So once you get to the point where you can say it's for the greater good of the greater number, you can justify anything, whether it's a Pearl Harbor or a 9-11 or a, a, um, a COVID-19 pandemic that doesn't exist or whatever. It's for the greater good of the greater number. So I start with that assumption. We must understand that that is the mentality or the rationale or the ethics, if you will, behind all of this. And the goal of all of these people in sort of an unidentified fraternity is to create a world government based on the principles of collectivism. And in order to do that, you've got to scare people enough to give up their sovereignty, to give up their unique cultures, to give up their judicial systems like you're in America, and give up all of these things we, we've cherished, give up your independence, your privacy, your freedom, because you cannot have a world government and still let people go around doing everything they want to do. You've got to tell them what to do for their own good, of course. We're back to that. So uh, that's the big picture. I'm glad you started off with the internationalization. That's what I learned about the United Nations, is that it's based on that principle. 
And, of course, they don't often talk about it quite as bluntly as I have just said it. But that really, once you analyze it, is what it's all about. So now, with some of these other things, the COVID, for example, and uh, terrorism, all of these things, uh, the threat to the environment, all of these things, the war on drugs, all of these things are boogeymen, mostly. I mean, there's some real things, of course, going on. You've got to have the real, real thing once in a while. But most of it is imaginary. It's like telling a ghost story to a child to scare the heck out of them. Say, you know, if, you, if you don't do what, what I tell you to do, what your mommy and daddy tell you to do, the ghost is going to get you. Or that thing under the bed is going to get you. Or it's whatever's in the closet in the middle of the night is going to come out and get you. You better be good. And so it's that kind of a thing when politicians and so-called leaders of society want citizens to do something to regiment themselves and to accept the loss of their liberty, to accept absurd taxation, to accept wars, death and destruction, all of these things. The only way you can really do it with their permission, with their permission, in fact, with their gratitude, is to convince them that it's for their own good. And this is the grand deception of the world for the last uh, mm, three or four decades, maybe longer than that. So that's my general answer to your question. Most of it is just to scare the dickens out of people so that they will willingly, gratefully accept any insult to their personal liberty, their freedom, uh, their privacy or anything else. Now, having said that, I guess the big topic of the day is the COVID-19 boogeyman. Uh, it's not real, in my opinion. I mean, this, yeah, people are dying. Yeah, people have been dying for quite a while. You, one thing you can be sure of, if you're born, you're going to die. <laughs> so what's this thing about death? Oh, well, you're dying. For, they're dying from a, a virus. Oh, really? Show me the virus. Nobody has been able to identify the virus. They just talk about it. If they've never seen it. It's a theoretical virus, like HIV is a theoretical virus. No one has ever seen it. If you go to the textbooks and look at these what look like photographs of the HIV virus. They're not photographs, they're art, artist's renditions or drawings. Nobody, nobody tells you that. They're, they look so realistic, you think, oh, it's a photograph of the virus. No, they've never seen an HIV virus, never will, because it doesn't exist. But you can scare the heck out of people, and you can sell a lot of vaccines and a lot of test kits and make a huge amount of money and, and, and sell the, uh, the treatment for it and make a huge pot of money. It doesn't have to exist as long as people think it exists, like the boogeyman in the closet or that creature under the bed. As long as they think it exists, they'll do everything mommy and daddy tells them to do to protect them from it. This is the story of the life in which we live. And so COVID-19 to me is very much in that category. Um, I believe personally that um, that viruses really, as they traditionally are understood or explained, don't even exist. I think they're really exosomes, but that's a scientific issue. It's, it's unimportant whether they're exosomes or viruses. It's kind of a technical thing. Either way, they're very bad because the people, they they're either cause illness or they're associated with illness. I think it's an association rather than a causal effect. But then I'm not a medical expert. I'm just going on the basis of the medical people that I trust and that I respect. And that's their opinion. And uh, the researchers have been very specific on this scientific data to support that. But I am not the one to make that value judgment, except to come to my own personal opinion, which is I think they're right. But even if they're not right, even, even if the virus really exists, um, it it's, couldn't be any different substantially than the seasonal flu. Like a, the coronavirus is a category of viruses and all of the flus and so forth and are in that general category. If you've ever had uh, the flu, you're going to test positive for Corona-19, whether you got it or not. I'm not even sure there is a 19, but you're going to test positive for a coronavirus of some kind. So all of this, when you delve into it, you find out that the, the science behind it is bogus. It's really bogus. But the way you hear it on television, oh, well, this doctor says that and this study says that. And Fauci stands up in the White House and he says this and every all the news commentators and talking heads repeat. So, oh, yeah, have you heard? And everybody plays it up. And it's a boogeyman under the bed. People die every year, especially old folks die every year from the least little infection that comes along. A common cold that you and I could take home. Oh, we've got the sniffles. Some 90-year-old guy sitting in the in the uh, nursing home gets the same 
common cold bug, and he's through. He's out the door. He died from it, you see. This is exactly what's going on with these COVID-19 statistics. All of the fatalities are coming from old people or people who already have other conditions, like they're ready to die anyway. Those are the people who are dying supposedly of COVID-19. How come all of the death rates for heart attack and these other things, uh, infections and pneumonia, all these other things, as the death rate goes up for COVID, it goes down for all the rest of them. It's a dead giveaway. They're just relabeling the same old death. They're relabeling them as COVID so that it can scare everybody. The boogeyman is still in the closet. Mm -hmm. And why? Well, you know, you already mentioned it in your question. What do you think about? Is it to take away the liberties of the American people and the people of the world? And the answer is yes. Can't you see it? Everybody should be able to see that. That's where it all goes. And it's been going in that direction for as long as I can remember. I became aware of this in 1960. I was just a young guy. I didn't know any of this stuff, but I, I found out some very disturbing news about the United Nations. And that got me diverted. I took a red pill and I said, well, that's not what I learned in school. And uh, But ever since 1960, I've seen this same trick that I'm describing, using fear and boogeyman uh, images to scare people into accepting and even being grateful for the surrender of their liberties and their privacy. And now we hear all these riots on the street, all being done by professionals, by the way. You don't think people just who are walking down the street or going to a job every day suddenly get all these black outfits and the hoods and they've got the axes and the hammers and the fire bombs. You don't think that just happens because they're mad, do you? Uh, no, those are professionals. They're soldiers. They're hired by George Soros or the deep state or somebody behind the scenes. It's a, a staged, phony, boogeyman race war. And But they're trying to make it a real one. They're trying to get people so mad and, and uh, insulted and injured, actually. If you can injure people, uh, they're going to get mad enough and sooner or later somebody's going to come out shooting and you'll have the real thing. That's what they're trying to do. But up until now, it's all engineered. It's, it's all on television. It's not real. You and I can walk around on the streets and we have friends of all races and nationalities. We have no problems whatsoever. But you look on television and you see these professionals up there throwing firebombs and breaking windows and burning cars and and, and shooting people and everything, that is theater. And uh, we must understand that until we recognize that we still, the good people are still in the majority, but we're not going to do anything about it unless we get organized and push back against this, uh, this boogeyman. So we have a real problem. Otherwise, they're going to create the thing they're trying to create. We're going to take our liberty from us and we'll think, oh my gosh, well, at least I didn't get Corona. I didn't die from Corona. I thank God for that, you know, even though I'm locked up in my room now. Or, well, I could go on and on. I've already wasted our whole period of time just giving you the background. But I think you get an idea of where my mind is and all of these things. To me, it's just a scare tactic. It's a boogeyman. And uh, it's very much to be feared, not because of what it is, but because of the impact it has on the thinking of the people of the world. You, you answered uh, my second question on BLM uh, and Antifa, and I was going to ask that because recently some of your lectures and interviews gained traction. Uh, once again, you gave a lecture, I think, more deadly than war decades ago, uh, laying out exactly what's happening with this Marxist revolution in the U.S. Uh, you interviewed the KGB defector Yuri Bezmenov on how Marxists would subvert America from within over a few generations. And, uh, I mean, you, you already mentioned the general idea of that. And so I think we don't have to go into the details because listeners should and must go listen to those uh, interviews and lectures, mm -hmm. which will be linked in the podcast descript the description and which they should purchase also from realityzone.com. But it's ast astonishing to see both your uh, lecture and, and Yuri's predictions uh, come to pass. And as, as you described, what we're witnessing now, and it's, you know, these B uh, BLM, Antifa, uh, protests, riots, professional, uh, you know, agitation movements are funded by Soros and basically today's monopoly capitalists. This makes me think of Anthony Sutton's work. And as we're seeing this right now, and now when I think of the 1917 Russian Bolshevik uh, revolution, uh, I think then that must have been the same thing that happened. You know, the same captains of industry and banking families funded the 1917 Russian Bolshevik revolution and probably the 1789 uh, French Jacobin 
uh, revolution. And so if you have any final comment on, on that aspect, as well as what do you think what we uh, can expect for the November uh, election? Because another prominent uh, recent guest that I had on, historian Edwin Black, yeah, he believes we will see things we, have, we never could have imagined uh, this fall and winter. Well, starting from the back end, <clears throat> I certainly agree with that. We've already seen things that we couldn't imagine. At least I couldn't. Uh, I thought I was pretty well informed. I understood the old traditional tactics of uh, revolution. And uh, <clears throat> as you pointed out, produced some, uh, some amazingly uh, prescient um, documentaries and presentations on it. Uh, you know, when you're, when you're trying to predict the future, it's always kind of risky. You're not so sure, even though you're, you know of the past and you know the present. And you think, well, if I can just intellectually project the, the line between the past and the present, if I can project that into the future, I've got to be right, correct? You know? Well, you're never, know, you're never sure because there's the things can come along and change that. So it turned out I, I was right. I don't claim any credit for that, except that I, I was able to read the documents and the study manuals uh, of our enemy. So I knew what I knew what motivated them. And I knew what their strategies were. So I just said, if this continues without any major deviation, this is where we're going. This is what's going to happen. And that is, of course, what is unfolding on the streets and in the universities and in halls of Congress right today. So now, uh, but back to the thing is, could we have imagined some of the twists and turns along the way? I didn't imagine ever in any of this that they would use technology because technology really was in its infancy back when I was revving up on all this information. There was not a lot of technology compared to what it is today. So I didn't see the idea that somebody could, could create a, a fantasy virus, for example, in the minds of people and get away with it. But I guess if, what I hadn't really thought is that when the time came that they could control the narrative in the major media, then they control the information source to the population. And that's all you have to do is control the information. And then facts make no difference because the facts are perceived to be whatever the people see on their television. Whether it's true or not, doesn't make a difference. It's with the perception. So uh, now we're living in an age where perception is even more important than fact because facts can be buried and they can be covered up. And perception can override all of that, you know. So um, having said that, um, uh, I guess uh, your question is, uh, well, where are we headed? Was that kind of yeah, where we started? Yeah, like this, yeah. Uh, you know, the elections and... The elections, yeah. Well, it, I'm going to repeat what I just said a moment ago. We know where we were in the past. We know where we are today, and there's quite a difference. And I'm going to say that unless there's some major changes made in the forces at work, we're going to continue going in that direction. So let's just take that for an example and assume that there are no major changes, that there will be no uh, great public awareness. They're going to continue to follow along and believe everything they see in the mainstream media. And we're going to continue having all of these uh, agents embedded in government and in the media uh, who when they're given directions will come out and all of them declare, uh, you know, lockdowns and so forth. Those are all agents, you understand, because they all move at the same time. They use the same rhetoric. You know, they've all been to the same school. They're getting the same written instructions from somebody to use the same language. It's a dead giveaway. Um, so unless there's a change in that, but then where we're headed is to, is to total slavery. They're going to achieve their goal. It'll, they'll call it the New World Order. That's what they've always called it. It's their name for it. The New World Order will be the Old World Order. It'll be the old one based on total tyranny, where the rulers are at the top and they're absolute supreme in their authority and their power. And the populations would be like serfs living, barely living and existing at the bottom and having no say-so in their own lives and trying to a kiss up to the leaders and get whatever little benefits they can get from them. And uh, that's their existence. That's the new world order, except they've added the layer of technology to it now. So that even though the serfs uh, have no authority of their own and can be snuffed in an instant or shuffled off to a camp or told what to do in any, any way, uh, they're still, they think they're living pretty well because they've got a color TV set. And uh, maybe they've got a car, although they're trying to take that away from people now. But at least they can get on the bus and they go to a theater, maybe, and, and see a, 
propaganda film that's, <laughs> or whatever, or they can go and watch a football game or, you know, they can have pleasures and drink their beer and so forth. So they think, well, this is a, they get this what life really is all about. But it really would be no different than the ancient systems where the serfs served their lords and masters, but with a layer of technology in between. So that's the that's the pessimistic scenario. I don't see a an optimistic scenario, but I do see a realistic scenario. It's sort of in the middle. I think if we do our job uh, well and, and do everything we can to awaken a sufficient number of people quickly enough, what is that number of people? I'm going to say about 15%. We need to reach 1% to 3% of real, uh, real chargers, movers and shakers to lead the movement. That 3% will influence the 15% who will actually get up off of their chairs and their couches and leave their TV sets and do something about it. And the other 65% will follow. We All we have to do is mobilize the 3% who can then mobilize the 15%, which is a huge task, by the way. But it's not the same as having to mobilize everybody. And I see that movement already beginning to happen as we speak. So if we can do that quickly enough, and then there's enough awareness then the sheer numbers of opposition and it will, will prevent this thing from happening. How? I don't know. I hope it doesn't turn out to be a, a confrontation in the street where everybody's out there with their rifles. You know, they, it's us against them because, Lord, these people have weapons that most people can't even imagine exist. And if it's a contest of weapons, then we lose. The war is going on for the mind. This is where the war is. It's, it's the battlefield is in the institutions and the organizations that people belong to and they follow their leaders. The battle is in the political parties and in the schools and in the educational system and all together. The battle is for control of alternate media. That's where the battle is. Uh, people need to show up at their city councils. They need to elect correct, honest people to the city council. They need a better mayor. They may better make sure all their their sheriffs are constitutional sheriffs. They got to start thinking about local instead of who you're going to vote for for president. You know the, that makes any difference. One man. They, that's so easy. Oh, if we can just get the right man in the White House, we can go back to our games. You know, no, 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 no. That's not the way it's going to work. But so now back to the realistic scenario. I think it's possible. It's definitely possible, and I see it happening now, which is the reason I created Red Pill University. That's the hub of all this movement, at least as I see it, of where we can build this coalition across. Oh, everybody has the same interest. We can disagree with a lot of things. But the one thing that most people, almost everybody will agree on, is that we want our freedom and our privacy, for God's sakes. Leave us alone. Stop telling us what to do for our own good. We'll figure that part out. And that's all we ask people to be in unity on, is that concept. And leave their differences at the door. Let's unite and push back against this collectivist juggernaut that's trying to put us all in prison. And it's happening. And if anybody really wants to see how I think that can unfold with their help, uh, they would come to redpilluniversity.org and read all about it, as they say. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but uh, there's a lot of things in your question. I think I touched on some of them. Yeah, and um, you kind of answered part of my, I guess, final question to get your thoughts uh, on the economy. And I just regarding the economy, you know, I was just flipping through the through your, through your book, and I just opened it like up to page five sixty two, which is kind of the summary of your pessimistic scenario of future events. And it's uncanny if you know people just read these two pages. It's literally like I can pull the headlines from yesterday, last week, last month. And it's all confirming like your fo your forecast where banks will become nationalized. Uh, there's an expert called Richard Werner who has been warning that the European Central Bank and other central banks are intentionally killing all other banks and that we're going to have digital electronic money, uh, which will be in an account with the central bank. So other banks won't be uh, needed anymore. And you, you, you've, uh, you talked about that in your book published, you know, 25 years ago, you said, uh, you know, there's a call to end the Fed now, but you say that the Fed will, would just become a subsidiary of the IMF and the World Bank. And what kind of freaks me out, which I've been thinking about a lot, is the, the real pessimistic scenario of, you know, I, I own a house. And so what happens if all money becomes digital? Um, my house is paid outright. 
but I have a property tax, right? Every year I have to pay. And if all money is digital and I can't get a job for whatever uh, reason and I can't pay my property tax, um, you know, maybe I'm a dissident or maybe they shut off my account because I'm a dissident or whatever. I can't pay my property tax even if it's like a hundred bucks and my house is taken from me. And it's like you're literally out on the street or in government housing. And I mean, what is someone to do in this situation? What is someone to do reminds me of a of a great video I discovered recently and added to our Red Pill University. And it was the story of uh, George Orwell, author of 1984. And the acting was brilliant. It was absolutely wonderful. Uh, you, you thought you were really looking at the man and his whole life was accurately portrayed as far as I could tell. i will cut to the cho- chase. And the final scene, he's on his deathbed. And uh, the, there's an imaginary newspaper or television reporter in the room asking him these questions and he's dying. And she said, well, tell me, what did you see when you wrote the book 1984? What did you see? And of course, then he quoted that famous line about, I see a boot forever smashing a human face, you know, that line. And then she, she says, well, uh, what, what can be done about it? And this is your question. He answered, he turns right, he's talking to her all this time, but for the final line in the movie, he turns and looks right at the camera and he says, the only thing that can be done about it is don't let it happen. And I thought that was so profound. Everybody's talking about, well, what what do we do if this happens? And the answer really is, we. It, there's nothing that I can think of if it happens. We just must not let it happen. And that's the question. What can we do to prevent it from coming to that? So uh, that's why I'm in the game. Uh, this is to the finish, believe it or not. I think it is. I, I think we're going to see... I'm an old duffer, right? I've been around probably longer than I deserve to be. But I expect that this issue is going to be determined in my lifetime. That means it's pretty close. Now, a guy like you, you've got a little more time, surely in your lifetime. But it's really close. Yeah. And it's going to go one way or the other, depending on what we do about it now. Not 10 years. What are we going to do when that happens? Let's talk about what do we do today? Who are we going to meet with today? How are we going to organize tomorrow morning? you got 10 o'clock open, you know? Let's get to it. Then who else can we bring to the meeting? What are we going to do? Let's lay some plans. How are we going to raise the money? Where do we go first? You take care of publicity. You take care of recruitment. You take care of communications. We'll have a meeting. What's our topic? Who do we get to speak? What's the, what's the call to action at the end of the meeting? Let's get on. How about Thursday? You know, this is what we have to do. Now, not figure, oh, what will happen if it comes to that? We must not let it happen. And, I, you know, I would say that I, I feel the same way. I, I feel it's going to happen in, in, in my lifetime. Uh, and I'm sad. To, I'm, I'm freaking out. And I'm sad to see pretty much everyone around me is going on with life as, as usual. And I'm like, what are you people doing? Don't you see what's, what's coming? And just to add on your comment with the interview uh, with Orwell, who said, you know, if, if it happens, there's, it's, it's just the end, basically. Uh, you're, you're saying the same thing. And again, I, I reference Edwin Black, the interview I did with him, who says, when this system comes, you don't want to be here. So it's like so many people, such as yourself and, and other top thinkers, are across the board saying the same thing. You don't want to be here. It's going to be a boot stamping out you know, the, the human face for, for, forever. So it's either fight and... Or, or, or die. I mean, the, and and that's all we can do. Um, are there any? Is there is there any final thought you have uh, to leave us with uh, as we head into what some have called the dark winter? Um, any any other topic that you want to get across? Well, I don't know. I would like to uh, close on the positive aspect of this point we're making right now. That this is a really serious issue, and it the deadline is upon us. And it's probably a life and death issue. So how do you how do you make that a pleasant topic? You don't, you know, because that's about as grim as it gets. But on the positive side of all that is that why are we here? 
aren't we here to do something significant? There's one thing I think everybody has to acknowledge that we are part of a continuum, whether we like it or not. Things have been going on before we arrived, and they're going to be going on for a long time after we're long gone. We're part of a continuum. That means, at least it means to me, that our reason for being here is to pass things through the pipe, so to speak, the pipe of time, to pass things through, to take things that we find, make them better, and then pass them through to those who follow. I think we're here to make things better. And so this is our opportunity. We have one wonderful opportunity to make things better at this particular time in our lives. Most people don't even have the opportunity, but it's thrust upon us, and I'm grateful for it. I, I go to bed every night thinking, boy, well, I did this, I did this, I wish I had more time, but at least I got that done. And I go to bed with a little smile thinking, well, we laid another brick, another foundation for this structure that's going to rise in the future. So that's very encouraging. We have something to live for. And I hate to say it, but something to die for. I guess if, if you're not willing to die for something, you're not, <laughs> what's the point of living for it, you know? Uh, that's a little grim again, but still, it's invigorating because I think it's a part of our nature. Most of us sense through our lives, and then as you get older, you sense it more and more, but that is that we are part of something really big that we don't understand, really big, and we're just a little piece of it, but we may never understand what it is, but we know that we're part of it because we have that instinct. The instinct. I do things, you do things. I, most people I talk to do things and they have, I don't know why I did that. That was really pretty risky to do, but I had to do it because it was the right thing to do. Oh my gosh, the right thing to do. Where did that concept come from the universe? You know, this thing of right and wrong, we have to do it. We're built to do the right thing. Okay, we don't have to understand it except to accept it. We are here to do the right thing. And the right thing, in my view, is to defend liberty and oppose tyranny. So, with that, what's next? How do we do that? Let's get on with it and have some fun along the way. Yeah, yeah, I would totally agree with you because I think most people think of what's the most, the safest or most economical thing to do. And I totally agree with you. It's, you know, what's the right thing to do uh, yeah. and whatever the cost. And I think the key is people shouldn't be afraid. Um, you know, not to be afraid. Like I said, I'm freaking out, but I'm not afraid. You know, whatever happens, I'm not afraid to die. You know, as you said, it's like whatever happens and it's exhilarating. It's exciting. It's not like I'm sad uh, or depressed. It's just like, let's, let's get on with the fight. You know, you can quote uh, Mel Gibson and Braveheart, you know, and all, all, all of that good stuff. And it's like, that's the excitement, whether we live or die, just participating uh, in, in this battle. And um, so I guess we'll, we'll leave it there. And, uh, you know, I, it reminds me of a quote. Uh, I don't know if you'll remember, but you sent me, you sent me this book uh, for Christmas one, one year as a thanks for helping out with your website. And you said with deep appreciation for all you have done for freedom. And I think listeners and everyone can agree that that applies to you a thousandfold for, for blazing the way for, for so many of us to, to do what we're doing and to stand up and not be afraid and just, you know, put, stick our necks uh, out there. Um, I will list all of your websites in the podcast description. I would urge listeners to subscribe to Mr. Griffin's budding Twitter and Facebook before they take it down and check out the shop at realityzone.com. Uh, Are there any other websites or projects of yours that we should be aware of or you want to emphasize? Well, yeah, thanks. thanks for that. I've got so many of them. I've got too many of them, don't I? Yeah, Reality Zone, Red Pill, Freedom Force, I mean, you name it. Uh, where I'm spending most of my time right now is at Red Pill University. That's the doorway. That's the front door for any kind of action you might want to take. The first thing is to find a place where you are comfortable, where the information that you rely on is reliable. I do my very best on that. I'm, if we find any mistakes or errors, we correct them as soon as possible. We're not infallible. But I'm telling you that the the uh, compilation of material that we've collected, they're mostly in videos now, is unsurpassed right now. So, and we only started about a year ago. It's unsurpassed anywhere in the world. We've already got the largest repository of information of that kind in the world, and we're adding to it constantly. But there comes a time when you've read enough books, you've seen enough videos, you know what the problem is. It's time to put your armor on and go out and engage in battle. So 
Red Pill University crosses both of those challenges together. We got to have the information. We have to know what we believe in. We have to know what our enemy is up to and what his strategy and tactics are. Once we do that, now we have to get organized and to start to push back and take take back the territory we've lost. And both of those happen at Red Pill University. The way it happens, uh, the taking back the territory is through what we call campuses. We're eager to create local organizations in every local community in the world, starting in the United States and Mexico. Hopefully we have a, a campus there very soon. I think we got one in, in Canada. But this is universal. This is everywhere in the world. We need to get boots on the ground and start defending liberty. All of that starts at Red Pill University. So um, that's the place to go. If you can't remember any of these others, go to redpilluniversity.org. All right, and I'll put all the, the links in the podcast description so people can go. I, I subscribe to the newsletters and I highly uh, recommend them. Uh, it's been a great pleasure and honor, Mr. Griffin. I hope you continue lighting the fire and leading the way for many years to come. And thank you for being on Geopolitics and Empire. Okay, well, thank you to you and keep up the great work. And uh, we'll see you uh, not so long next time. It'll be sooner. I hope you enjoyed this Geopolitics and Empire podcast and interview. I would like to remind you that our website is geopoliticsandempire.com and you can sign up for our mailing list that goes out each weekend with the latest podcast and a long collection of important news headlines. It's good to sign up for the newsletter in case we experience censorship and deplatforming. You can help the Geopolitics and Empire podcast by subscribing to and interacting with all of our channels such as YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Gab, Minds, and Steemit. You can also help us by leaving a rating and review on your favorite podcast platforms such as iTunes, CastBox, Stitcher, Spreaker, and so on. Finally, if you value our work and our mission and would like to see us continue interviewing experts from across the political spectrum, please consider leaving a one-time donation via PayPal or Bitcoin or becoming a regular monthly supporter on our Patreon. All the links can be found on geopoliticsandempire.com. Thanks for listening.